My father came in contact with Sri Sathya Sai Baba in 1971. Mm. And he said very clearly, I remember, um, he called all three of us children and he said, God has taken a human form. He's here, come and enjoy. I'll speak personally, um, uh, being a young man, um, somewhat rebellious um, in my high school, I said, I have no time for all these holy men and saints and, and, and you know, swamis. Um, I am a man of science and science is my path and science is my God. And all this hocus pocus means nothing to me. And so for 25 years, I kept away from Sai Baba. But then Sai Baba came to Sunny Anand, and? It changed me completely. It was the dawning of a new life for Dr. Kamalji Sunny Anand from Memphis, Tennessee. Finally, finding Sai Baba in his heart changed this internationally acclaimed expert in the field of pediatric critical care in all ways. Nonetheless, eventually Dr. Anand would come to visit the dark night of the soul a professional crisis of enormous magnitude. More on this, more on Sai Baba, follows. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded in San Diego, California, in the spring of 2015. Sonny, tell me about where you are in your life right now, spiritually. Sonny's an observer, um, a witness, watching the play of... Uh, mind and matter on the screen of consciousness. Is this because Sonny professionally is in the illusory human form is a professor? Yes, uh, the, the Sonny um, body has got to play a role. Uh, and to put, play that role, he puts on this dress of the professor. The title and the uh, decoration and whatever else goes with it. Who's the real Sonny? The sunny, um, or the the aspect behind sunny, sunny is simply a projection of experiences from many lifetimes, of uh, this lifetime, and is formed an entity called sunny. Um, it's. an undifferentiated consciousness that decided to play the game of attachment and desires, of um, roles and responsibilities, of um, goals and ambitions, uh, of relationships. And all of that put together became the sunny. So all I can say is what I, I am not. I have not yet found words or the eloquence to describe what I am or who am I. Mm -hmm. um, and I think slowly, gradually, inexorably, that realization is dawning. Uh, maybe someday those words will come, those images will be created, but right now, Sonny is simply watching the play of mind on consciousness. I'm sure it's a long list of things that you know you are not. <laughs> Does that list continue to grow? Do you still find things that you are not? Yes. Hmm. Absolutely. And what does the observer feel like, the witness you, you say that you are? That term is used with great ease by a lot of people. And as a journalist, I was a witness but sometimes I'm confused in the spiritual. What is it that I'm supposed to be learning being the witness about the unfolding drama in front of us? How would you answer that? I, I'd, I'd give an analogy, for example. Uh, the analogy is that of a dream sequence. Um, we all have dreams, and in that dream, we are participating in the dream, um, and we are aware of everything that's going on. And 
the one that is aware of everything's going on and intuitively we are also aware of the fact that we are dreaming yet we are a participant in that dream we are uh, a walker in that procession um, and so that's that's probably an analogy that is is closest you ca you can't uh, when you wake up, you realize that it was only a dream, but you were aware of that dream, you know, even while dreaming. So I think that's where the witness is, is in awareness of the participant, of being a participant, the awareness of everything else that's happening in the dream, but also the awareness of the fact that it is a dream, it is illusory. Mm -hmm. Is it easier for you as you become more advanced in your spiritual understanding, being a lifelong Sikh, being aware of Sai Baba and his importance in your life, is it easier to be a witness without judgment or do you still find yourself wrestling with judgment by the things you witness? Most of the time I can look at it without judgment. That's great. Um, but believe me, it's not all the time. Um, there are circumstances, there are situations where um, the old structure of good, bad, beautiful, ugly, whatever, mm -hmm. um, those, those kinds of judgments do crop up. And how do you handle the judgments coming to you from others, like we all have to deal with? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, I, I will give you a, a very um, personal experience over the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, over my entire career, I've been thought of as an extremely good doctor, mm -hmm. as, as someone who took excellent care of his patients, uh, I work in an intensive care unit. I take care of babies and children with severe injuries or illnesses and things like that. And I was always held up as the example um, of the cutting edge of care, providing good clinical care. And just two and a half years ago, um, my clinical care was questioned and judgment was passed mm -hmm. on me. Not just put forth, but passed. Yeah, judgment was passed on me saying, you know, that I had not lived up to the standard of care. There were political reasons mm -hmm. for that to happen. And it was, it was a tough test. For most of us, it would be a crisis. It was, it was in some ways a crisis because my my license to practice, uh, my clinical privileges at the hospital where uh, I was uh, practicing, etc., were all put up, uh, were all endangered. Mm -hmm. um, and um, having been through that experience, I became bulletproof. Mm. It doesn't matter anymore. What, what a profound experience. Thank you so much for sharing it. I wouldn't expect anybody to share an experience like that just because of the difficulty. What else can you share with us that it, it led you to see in yourself that maybe you weren't aware of before? Well, it certainly brought into question as to how attached I am to a clinical reputation, um, to a certain standing in my profession. Uh, and um, and that attachment was what caused the, um, shall I say, angst or the aggravation um, or the pain mm -hmm. uh, that I felt coming up before a peer review committee and being told that this is um, below the standard of care. So they rendered a judgment. Oh, absolutely. Not once, but three times. Based on politics, innuendo, no doubt, and hearsay. Yep. Uh, 
you know, and, and, and any one of us is a victim, a potential victim to that. Yeah, and total fabrication. Yeah. Uh, falsifying of medical records for the political gain of someone else of uh, other things so but going through all of that I realized that it was my own attachment it was the fact that I was so attached to this doctor role that was causing the pain and the grief and once I realized that I said Hmm. Doesn't matter. Interesting. What a great leap forward for you. Costly, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you draw from spiritually coming through the darkest moments there? What I was able to draw upon was the framework that Swami Sri Satya Sai Baba had put in place. It was amazing um, how gradually and beautifully he had made us walk this path. He had given us immense love, way more in importance than we deserved, <laughs> um, and numerous experiences to realize that um, all of his um, tests were simply preparing us to break out of the mold into which we had cast ourselves. And it's the same thing that Iti was referring to as, you know, breaking those boxes. We put ourselves into so many boxes. Mm -hmm. This is um, something I'd like to follow up with for another second because it's of such vital importance to all of us <coughs> based on my point of view that none of us is ever home free of risks of our let's say reputation our uh, our personhood being damaged by something from outside I mean you could have a serious accident mm -hmm. uh, that maybe wasn't your fault but the judge and jury could say that it was your fault and your life could be just spun around in a heartbeat. We're never immune to that risk, are we? No. So you live with that now with a whole different outlook because you've come through it once. Mm -hmm. Has it caused you to adjust your life in any way, to make a difference in how you see the world today? Yes, it has given me much greater understanding. It has given me much greater appreciation for how difficult attachment and pain and grief can be. Um, I find myself far more willing, um, far more likely to assume good intentions, to assume not willful fault in others, but perhaps inattention, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, lapse in memory, perhaps um, uh, unaware or ignorance about you know particular aspects. So it does help me to understand um, the. Um, fallibility of the human condition mm -hmm. um, and to see that what I previously had thought were faults in others um, could simply be misunderstandings on my own part. Even though you've been on a s profound spiritual path presumably up to the time that Baba came into your life, how was that altered by having this in your in your physical presence, uh, his the weight of what he represented in your life. How did that change you at all? It changed me completely. I can tell you, I was very fanatic. I was very much committed to the um, uh, sick way of life and and the the sick way of worship, uh, etc. My father came in contact with 
Sri Sapta Sai Baba in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, I was still I was still in high school um, at that time, and he said very clearly. I remember um, he called all three of us children, and he said, "God has taken a human form. He's here. Come and enjoy. Come and experience Him." I like the first word. Come and enjoy it. Yeah. Um, as he was enjoying at that time, um, but I'll speak personally, um, uh, being a young man, um, somewhat rebellious um, in my high school, I said, I have no time for all these holy men and saints and, and, and you know, swamis. Um, I am a man of science. and science is my path and science is my God and science is uh, what I am going to commit myself to and all this hocus pocus means nothing to me and so for 25 years I kept away from Sai Baba my goodness 25 actually less than that a, a, a few years less than that we moved to Atlanta in 1993. At that time, Sri Satyasai Baba had come into my wife's life. She was very committed. She wanted to go to the Science Center in Atlanta with beautiful, beautiful devotees who were at that time uh, and are still very, very committed to, sh to Swami. And I would not hear of it. And I said, no, we are six. We have to go to the Gurudwara. We have to take our children to the Gurudwara. And there was this big battle between us, the Mahabharata in the Anand household. Because as Swami would have it, on Sunday is the service for the Gurudwara. On Sunday at that time were the bhajans for the Sai Center. And you could not be at both. They were <laughs> miles and miles apart. Yeah. Physically. <laughs> and so we, we came to a compromise that one weekend we would go to the Gurdwara, one weekend we would go to Bhajans. Mm -hmm. um, and a few months of that, and suddenly one day, I still remember the Bhajan that was being sung. Um, it was in someone's basement in Atlanta, and the Bhajan was. Ikabar Kshama Karo Sai Mere Baba Shri Satya Sai What means, forgive me this once, my Sai, this once, please forgive me. And for whatever reason, the floodgates opened mm. and I cried. It still brings tears to my eyes when I think of that. And I cried that entire night. I could not stop crying. It was just a lot of cleansing was happening. And then I could, you know, come into the space of devotion, of trying to learn something from this great phenomenon of Sri Satya Sai Baba. And two years later, we were in his presence. <laughs> As a scientist, does it shock you? There was some confusion, no question. Um, you know, where is your objective self? Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that was called into question, and that was tested. Um, but beyond the uh, objectivity and beyond this, the scientific framework from which I was operating was a higher, more fuller truth. Um, and I recall our very first visit to Puttaparthi. I recall it was October of 1996. I recall second, sitting in darshan lines at the very first darshan, you know, just bawling, mm -hmm. just crying, you know, um, because it was difficult to understand the degree of love, the waves of love that Swami emanated at that time. The second darshan, 
early morning, Sunny is sitting in the line, watching Swami come. Earlier had seen behind him people who were on wheelchairs, on, you know, various different degrees of disability. And at the end of darshan, Swami walks up to one young man and says, get up. This young man is sitting on the wheelchair. Swami tells him, get up, go sit there. And his father, this child's, this young man's father is telling Swami, within my earshot, see the blessing in this, um, Swami, he has never been able to walk. He has never walked. And Swami just brushed the father aside and tells this boy in a very angry, forceful tone, get up, go sit over there. Amazing. And this young man gets up from his wheelchair, walks three or four steps, and sits down on the bench, which is the stone slab, yes. stone slab mm -hmm. against the wall. And, and then Swami just glides away, walks back to the mandir for the interviews and so on, bhajans finish, um, end of darshan. I approach this father, what about your son? I'm a doctor, tell me. And he says he has today walked for the first time in his life. Oh my goodness. That boy was crying on the wheelchair. And the few days that we stayed in the ashram, I could see this child get out of his wheelchair, hold on to the father, and be able to walk and sit on those stone slabs. Swami, at least in my presence, never interacted with this family again. But it was a huge challenge for me as a physician, as a scientist, who uh, I, I work in developmental neurobiology, developmental neuroscience, to imagine that this child who had been paralyzed from birth in one instant had started walking. Mm. It called into question a lot of things. And I can tell you those first few years were confusing. Um, but also very uplifting. Um, in the time we have left, I want to talk about something that's not involved specifically with your life, but with the life of your father. Mm -hmm. He's 93, yes. presumably in fair health. Yes. But that by Baba's own decree, he's a Jivan Mukta, which makes him one of the few beings on the earth today who's fully realized all the time. There isn't just a, an awakening for a moment or an hour or a week, but he's in constant perpetual awakening state. Mm -hmm. What must that represent to you? A reassurance that someday all of us can get there. Um, also, a role model that personally I can relate to. It was um, amazing to see, to grow up in a household where my father from a very early age, for as long as I can remember as a child, had been walking the spiritual path, had been um, contemplating, meditating, remembering the Lord, had been surrendering slowly all aspects of his life. And by his example, he taught me that surrender is an illusion. Surrender is an illusion. Surrender is an illusion until it is complete. And then you really know that it was an illusion. 
Because our lives are an illusion. Yes. Because the one that is surrendering, the one that to whom one is surrendering, and the process of surrender itself is all one. Surrender is something that starts out as an illusion, gradually gains reality, and when it is complete, you realize that it was an illusion all along. Mm -hmm. That the one who has surrendered, the one to whom you have surrendered, and the process of surrendering was all one. So we think we have surrendered. Truly, we truly start surrendering. We start surrendering all aspects are of ourselves. And once that surrender is complete, we realize there was nothing to surrender to. How close are you to your father's understanding of the illusory nature of who you are, as, as I see you? Mm -hmm. I can't see the real Sunday. I, I, I know the real Sunday is, as Baba teaches and as non-duality insists, is myself. But how close are you to seeing that about yourself? I don't know. Truthfully, Be because I, I think don't. my impression is that more and more people are starting to get the the drill pretty well, mm -hmm. and they're on the path. And yeah. and it, as we learned from your wife, if you say something over and over again, one day it might actually click. Mm -hmm. But just to say, as Baba teaches us, "I am God. I am God. I am no different from God." could be just words until one day it really registers. Yeah. And when it registers, then there will be no need to say it. <laughs> no need to say it. it. It just is. So I don't know where I am on this journey, truly. Yes, like you, like anyone else, I am walking the, that path. Um, I do have... Um, many, many people to thank who have come in our lives and given us signposts along the way. Mm -hmm. And those uh, role models and those examples, those mentors are, are really important. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, to maintain the enthusiasm to continue on this path. Well, this has been a very interesting talk. I think I'll end it here only because I'd like to devote a, an entire program to learning more about what it must be like to be the son of the Jivan Mukta. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sonny. Thank I you, Ted. I appreciate it. And Sai Ram. Sai Ram. Sai Ram. Um, Sonny and Ithi are so so different. He is all the earth and I'm all the other side. Where <laughs> he is so, so grounded and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he loves and believes in, in being very, um, what's the word I'm looking for anyway. And the opposite is his wife, totally ostentatious, <laughs> loves everything that money can buy and, and enjoys it to the hilt, yeah. mind you. I don't believe that for a minute, but oh. I do believe the fact that Whereas sunny is the earth, you must be the cosmos. I don't know about that, but he, he would have to answer what I am to him. Yeah. But I can say I've, um, I've enjoyed life thoroughly in getting to know my life partner as a friend. And you share Sai Baba in common. That is true. That, 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 that was, that's a journey that has brought us where we are today. Thank you.